Hello, everybody. I'll just give a minute for some more people to join. Okay, so welcome everybody. We're so glad to have you here with us today for the In Cheng Distinguished Lecture Series on Buddhism. My name is Vicki Baker and I'm the coordinator of the lecture series at UBC. UBC is located on the traditional and unceded territory of the Musqueam First Nation. We acknowledge and support their historical and ongoing care for the land. This lecture series is a collaboration between the Tsuchi Foundation and seven partner universities. We're pleased to welcome you to this third lecture in the series entitled Fostering Education Beyond the Classroom, Examples from Republican Buddhism and Their Legacy Today by Dr. Stefania Trevagnin. We would like to note a small change to the program. Our first discussant, Dr. Chin Long Lin, unfortunately is unable to join us today. However, we're lucky to have Dr. Mingnan Lin, also from the Tsuchi Medical Foundation, in his place, who will deliver the commentary. Now, if I can introduce Professor Jinhua Chen from the Department of Asian Studies at UBC to say a few words. Thank you, Vicky. Uh, thank you, so friends and colleagues around the world to join this event. I'm Jin Hua Chen. Uh, I teach East Asian Buddhism at UBC. Uh, we are very honored uh, to host uh, this uh, lectures uh, by Professor Stefania uh, Trosvakri. And uh, I will introduce her uh, shortly. But uh, uh, before <laughs> we start these lectures, I would like to thank uh, CG Foundations uh, to um, give us uh, this opportunity uh, to uh, set up uh, one, this is wonderful lecture series. Uh, we have already uh, done two lectures uh, so far and today is the third one. Uh, this lecture series is intends to bring uh, these uh, distinguished scholars on Buddhism uh, in the context of uh, Buddhism's role in uh, coping with uh, some urgent issues uh, facing our uh, contemporary society. Uh, so uh, this is a very uh, important uh, topic. And uh, I uh, am very grateful uh, for the Tsuji uh, Foundations for this uh, wisdom, uh, for, uh, for, the, for the wisdom of giving us such a support. And I, I'm also very grateful to uh, many colleagues, uh, many friends who uh, also uh, supported these uh, endeavors. Particularly, I want to thank my friends, uh, my colleague, Professor uh, uh, Ray Hall from the SG University. And uh, he's also um, uh, associates of uh, CEO of the SG Foundation. So uh, let me now invite Professor Paul uh, to say a few words before I introduce Professor uh, Stefania uh, Well, Ray? Thank you, Professor Chen, and thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Vicky Baker. And I deeply express my gratitude to the um, uh, keynote speaker, Professor Stephania Trevigan, and also the participant Andrea, and also Dr. Lin Mingnan to join this uh, great event. And I'm the um, uh, Dr. Ray Chen He, I'm the Deputy CEO of Tsuji Foundation, and also Associate Professor of Tsuji University. I'm glad to uh, collaborate with the uh, UBC and the other uh, seven universities to uh, organize this uh, lecture series. And this is the third lectures. And, and this is very wonderful to have this opportunity to share our research and ideal on the contemporary Buddhism, especially today's topic is about Republican Buddhism education, which is a very important 
to understand and to develop the modern Buddhism. I think the Republican Buddhism in early time is a very uh, critical uh, turning point to open up the uh, development and establishment of the uh, Buddhism now we have today. So I'm glad and to have this opportunity to join this. And I would like to learn from Professor Stephanie Trevigan and the other two uh, participants uh, to learn these uh, great issues. And I say thank you again on behalf of our uh, Suji Foundation and also the founder, Dharma Method Zheng Yan, to uh, everyone who joined this event. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rafe. And uh, so now it's my pleasure to introduce you, uh, Professor Stefania Strabakin. Uh, Professor um, Strabakin uh, currently teaches at the SOAS, University of London. Before joining SOAS, she was the founding directors of the Center for the Studies of Religions and Cultures in Asia at the universities of the Groningen. Uh, uh, from 2013 uh, till 2020. So uh, she spent almost seven years in uh, at this university, I believe this is in Lithuania, right? Uh, it was at SOAS that she obtains her doctorate degree with a dis uh, dissertation on venerable in Shun. So she is one of the, uh, I don't know, there's already quite a few uh, dissertations uh, on insert, but the, her distinctions must be one of the, the earliest uh, distinctions on uh, Venables insert. Uh, Professor Charles Bergman has done extensive sort of researches among Buddhist communities in, in, in both mainland China and Taiwan, and was visiting scholars in different institutions in both uh, mainland China and Taiwan. But researches and publications analyze several aspects of Buddhism and Buddhist in modern China and uh, in, in, in uh, modern mainland China and Taiwan, including snipe and writings of the Hmong in Sun, meanings of Lenjian, Huajiao, conceptual and institutional histories of Sangha education, histories and practice of Buddhist nuns in uh, Republican China and uh, Taiwan, uh, reception histories of traditional texts and value in the modern areas, Buddhist adoptions of medium and artificial intelligence. So this is uh, the last one, it's really uh, uh, very important topic <laughs> for, uh, a, uh, for uh, a, so the importance of the Buddhism for uh, modern societies. Her, uh, publications include this at this volume of uh, religions and mediums in China, uh, published by uh, Ludwig in 2016. And uh, we, I also need to mention in particular uh, her three volume series on concept and methods for the studies of Chinese religions. Uh, so this is uh, these are very impressive um, uh, publications. So uh, today we have uh, an honors of uh, uh, listening to Professor uh, Charles Barkley. So uh, Stefania, please. All right, uh, let me share the screen. Okay. I hope you can, you can see and hear me properly. Um, thank you. First of all, I, before I start my talk, I would love to express my gratitude to uh, UBC and Chen Jinghua also for your very nice um, introduction, Zuji Foundation um, and the, all the university consortium for of this uh, distinguished lecture series for inviting me to be part of it. It's a very nice opportunity to reflect critically on Buddhist history and practices and how Buddhism can position itself and in and contribute to this new global society we are living in. Um, my talk today will be about the sphere of education. I chose this particular theme is something that I've been working on recently, but I think it's also a channel to see 
uh, a contribution of Buddhism um, to uh, the new global society. Um, so education within Buddhism, but also within China uh, in the past, the more recent time. And I will address example, examples within, but mostly outside the temples. So, so try to look at way of education beyond um, the classical school setting. The domain of Buddhist education um, makes a distinction between education for the Sangha and Buddhist learning from the Sangha for the lay believers. In the context of education within for lay society, Buddhist monastics and lay intellectuals did more than simply lecturing the laity about the doctrinal principles and practices. For instance, in both the pre-modern and modern China, they have offered elementary and non-religious teaching whenever and wherever public schools were not available. Buddhist institutions also served sometimes as the only providers of education for certain social groups, especially women. And they have functions as examples of private learning and models for other forms of institution like the Confucian academies, Shuyuan, in the pre-modern era. In consideration of the positive guidance that Buddhist ethics could have offered, Chinese monastics have also called to uh, teach in other venues like military camps or prisons. Finally, besides formal lecturing, Chinese monastics have often inspired by example and facilitated the development of the surrounding community through their leadership, continuous guidance, and practical initiative. Multiple then have been the ways in which Buddhists could intervene in society and educate, offering forms of learning that very often have gone beyond the traditional format and the space of a classroom. This talk will address Buddhists as educators for society at large, and outside the temples, exploring uh, several cases, intellectual arguments and concrete activities from the first half of the 20th century. That is when a new venues and possibilities open for Buddhist education and reach the spectrum of practices already performed in the imperial time. I will mention four poss possibilities of education practices, four spheres and modalities for Buddhists to intervene and contribute to the public sphere. The sponsorship and opening of elementary non-religious schools for the communities, learning from charismatic models when monastics are simply led by example and inspire positive changes, exposing the army to the Dharma with militaries residing or visited temples and being lectured by the Sangha, especially at the time of the critical time, like the Sino-Japanese conflict, and then exposing prisons inmates to the Dharma. This paper will explore more specifically the final three um, examples, the final three categories that I mentioned just now. This engagement in society in the Republican era represents a further development of patterns of the pre-modern period. So it, we should not really think of something completely new, but also a form of continuity of what actually has happened before. It, and it has continued further after the Republican period and is still visible today although in a different format due to a new social historical context. Given the overall theme of this series, this talk will end with reflections on potentials for Buddhists as educators in the 21st century, going beyond the Chinese region. Certainly, the education initiatives listed in this talk could very well uh, be labeled under the umbrella concept of Renjian Fo Zhao, humanistic uh, Buddhism, how it is, or Buddhism for the human realm has been translated in many ways uh, in English. The possibility of individual and social change for Buddhism, with Buddhism intended as Buddha Dharma and moral paradigms, but also as a community of practitioners, the slogan expressions Buddhization um, for Hua or leading and transforming through Buddha's teachings, so for Hua or uh, for Fa Hua Tao, could identify Buddhist modalities in pre-modern China, but become, became identity markers, especially for a socially present Buddhism that we see from the early 20th century. And education in its variants has been and is indeed a tool for social change. At the same time, as I will explain, process and aims of Buddhist education seem to reflect or certainly share key elements of the foundation of traditional Chinese Confucian education. An important point that I would like to discuss is how education practices in China have tried to be instrumental for the foundation of ethical sustainability, a topic or a, a, an expression that you will see coming up in other slides as well. And as a follow-up point, what these lessons from China 
could teach to the contemporary and future global society. So let's go back to China and see China so, uh, as a whole, as uh, with Buddhism part of it. So Confucius and the Buddha are always seen as the two educators. So Confucius was a sage from the past. He was and still is conceived as the educator in China. Buddha has also been labeled as educator. In China, changes in education have been keen to read shifts in historical and social patterns. According to um, a number of scholars, anyone who wants to really understand Chinese history should first of all have a glimpse um, and an, a, a kind of understanding of the history of Chinese education. At the same time, in the history of Indian Buddhism, but the same can be said also about China, a number of scholars have argued that the history of Buddhist education is the history of the Buddhist Sangha. So it seems that the study of education can give, um, it's is, is very important to understand the history of, of, uh, of China as a place, but also the history of development of the Buddhist community. Confucian ideals and Buddhist education practices have interacted mutually influencing each other and together contributed to the uniqueness of the history of Chinese education. As um, Thomas Lee has very well summarized in his uh, amazing book on traditional education in China, Chinese educational history is the product and, uh, of a combined influence of many intellectual forces, including popular religious practices. Before turning my attention to education from the Sangha to society outside the classroom, I then would like to shift our attention to education in traditional China and so back to Confucius as the educator. So to show points of contact uh, between underlying principles and scope of Confucian education and Buddhist education, in which ways the interaction with Buddhism has affected the traditional Chinese ways of learning. Key features of education in China, conceptualization and practices form the background that also define, in my view, trajectories undertaken by Buddhist education within China as well. At the same time, I will specify how certain Buddhist education practices have not been just informed by the Chinese cultural milieu, but have also influenced certain patterns of development of non-religious education. If we think of uh, early education practices from the time of um, the reformer of Chinese education, namely Confucius, two key elements emerge um, and they form the kind of basis of later understanding of learning in China. But there are certainly some people that come up, especially um, from the time of Confucius. So study with an effect on the private sphere. So education as a form of self-cultivation improvement of a moral self, but also study with effect on the public sphere. So a better moral self would contribute to a better society. Learning in a Confucian, early Confucian understanding and, and Confucian tradition does have a practical implication then. It was not conceived just as a way to build an ego, but to create a better humane society. A number of characters are always found if we read the Analects or in this old, also the Book of Manchus, so in Confucian discussions of education. Certainly the character Ren could be intended as the keyword in uh, Confucius education ideas and implies that learning xue, is directed to frame a good society. So to frame, and then so the idea that Ren is representative of education because the point of education is to create a goodness, a good relationship among people. Human beings are relational beings and education is socially relevant. This idea can be applied not just to a Confucian public context. In fact, whether it is for the Sangha or from the Sangha, learning in Buddhism has also been conceived with the goal to improve the moral dimension of the individual and has been seen as conducive to generate a better life for the humanity. Chinese perceived education as moral education and Buddhism, so Chinese and Confucians perceived education as moral education and Buddhism in its teachings rather than in the institution is seen as a form of ethics, providing guidelines for self-correction and, 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 and self-improvement. If we think of the Renjian uh, Fojiao discourse, we cannot forget the goal to create a pure land on earth, which goes very close to the um, Confucian ideas to create a better society. Buddhist practice and the purpose of Chinese education do show similarities then. Buddhism as education in its essence and purposes develop in parallel to Chinese education, but also merged 
with the Chinese environment and, and, and influence the development structurally of the Chinese public education. We should that talk in terms of religious influence actually on Chinese education and not just the Buddhist influence on Chinese education. And remember that um, there were Buddhist influences, especially from the town, but also Taoist influences. So this talk is all about Buddhism um, and Confucianism, but I also want to stress that there, is, there should be um, also some memory of the importance of Taoism and Taoist influence in this matter. So in other words, religions in China, communities and practices have shaped Chinese non-religions, uh, Confucian-based education. And it did that in a number of ways. And we just list a few, of, um, a few of that here. So first of all, the uh, master-disciple relation that we find in Buddhism and in Taoism became a kind of model for the teacher pupil connection that we see in a Confucian understanding of education. Related to this, the specific role of a teacher in religious and secular Confucian context, the authority that the teacher embeds, the transmission of the formation of lineages and the formation of schools, this is a trait that was present even before the arrival of Buddhism in China, but it was certainly reinforced, especially through their practice in a religious and Buddhist context. Then the collection of texts as a canonized knowledge um, at the basis of specific schools in Buddhism and Taoism that suggested the concept of orthodoxy of knowledge even outside of a religious context. Temples printed, produced books and hosted functions as libraries and phenomena that then extended outside the boundaries of Buddhist temples. The specific components of education program um, of the way that somehow the Sangha was learning Buddhism within the temple the recitation of texts, so oratory skills, the ability to move from different languages, if we think of the translation of texts from Sanskrit into Chinese, and the same pillars of the foundation of the institution of the temple. So the fact that Sangha were living um, in, a, uh, in a structure, following a strict dis um, dis discipline, and, and taking the temple as a space for private cultivation, and making private learning and private cultivation somehow coincide. All these elements instigated the development of disciplines, uh, so particular um, subject like poetry and the study of phonetics and inspire the Confucian Shuyuan, uh, the Confucian Academy as an intellectual space in the song. So all these aspects that you find in Buddhist temples, the way they were structured, the way that people were actually studying there, somehow had brought some innovation within the Confucian or secular um, um, education. Buddhist temples were seen as detached lens for intellectual upbringing. Moreover, Buddhist temples were welcoming non-Buddhists to retreat and study non-Buddhist texts there, offering them space for private self-study, but also for learning secular subjects through teachers who were members of the Sangha. It was a kind of space where um, you could take a sabbatical in these terms and just um, have your own retreat and get this knowledge and ethical guidance. The following step was for monastics to build proper non-religious schools within the temple or outside the temple. That's something that also started happening um, and in, in the pre-modern era, but especially later on from the Republican period onwards. The mid of the fifth century, and this is um, the final aspect that I want to underline, marks also the start of nuns education in Buddhism. And it is important to remember that the creation of female Buddhist education had a great impact on women's education overall. In fact, Buddhist nunneries or Taoist female temples, so religious institutions, were at the end the only places for women to receive an education at that time. But influence aside, we can also talk about synergies between Buddhist and non-Buddhist education. So when uh, non-Buddhist education, so it's not just Buddhist modalities of Buddhist education affecting uh, education outside the monastery, but also how non-Buddhist education, and Confucian education, enter the temple and somehow affected the way that monks and nuns were learning. Chinese Buddhist monastics were not just Buddhist, but also, and in certain respects, first of all, they were Chinese. Stress on their Chinese identity is evinced even more strongly from the Republican era, and that is polarizing discourse of nationalism, of course. This also meant that the key texts that form learning in China, like Confucian texts, were included in the curriculum of the, um, of the Seiyuan, of the temple. The five classics, the four books, were read and included in the curriculum in the pre-modern period and highly studied even more recently. And indeed, as we will see later, Buddhist monastics brought secular education into the sacred temple or proposed secular moral education outside 
the temple premises. So Buddhists were not refusing uh, a form of learning or subject of learning that were not just um, Buddhist. Now, after this um, introduction, what I really wanted to show, since we are talking about Chinese Buddhism, that uh, we should look at the development of education in Buddhism, but also think that is happening in China, where education was conceived in a specific way under a specific Confucian framing. But now I want to go and have a look at the more recent times so of the late Chinese and the Republican era. Chinese education has changed towards, uh, so not just Buddhist education, Chinese education in general has changed towards the late Qing and especially in the Republican era. The renewal of a country did rely on changes in education. Let us think of slogan on the, um, like Zhou Yu Wan Nang, so the um, omnipotence of education and the calls to save the country through education, Zhao Yu Zhu Wu. Uh, that have recurred throughout modern Chinese history, including the Republican period. Similar phenomenon occur in the Buddhist sphere, of course, as well. And here again, changes happen in both the context of Sangha education and education Buddhist and not for the laity. In this section, I will explain what I call the theories of education, Chinese, more general, and also Buddhist that were advanced at the time of changes in Chinese civilization and the, the, the time of the repositioning of religious actors in the social sphere. Since the late Qin, Buddhist clerics and the laity started framing Buddhism and Buddhist practices, practice within a new set of conceptual categories, especially analytical ideas importing from the West or via Japan, and also through a revisited and redefined Chinese and Buddhist endogenous ideas. So Buddhists work to reposition themselves and their tradition in the new cultural and political time. They updated Buddhist taxonomy and vocabulary and articulated new semantics of traditional terminologies. This process was unfolding in a wider social intellectual milieu of challenges and paradigm shifts, a milieu uh, that involved other groups of patterns with whom Buddhists acted in parallel, but also intersected. So I will focus, thinking of this spe specific uh, cultural intellectual background, I will focus on the arguments advanced by two figures, arguments that are mostly about Buddhism, but also about the idea of education in China at that specific time. I'm going to look at the lay intellectual Wan Yang, uh, who was trained in Chinese and Western philosophy, but also in Buddhism a theorizer of education and culture, the initiator of schools open not only for members of the monastic community, and the monk, uh, sorry, and the monk Tsehan, another influential Buddhist leader in the first half of the 20th century. Tsehan lived in China in the Republican period. He engaged in all the major debates that animated the Buddhist and otherwise intellectual cycles in the 1930s and proposed arguments that resonate but didn't fully coincide with a position that the famous reformer Tai Xu uh, also had. Zahan moved to Taiwan in the late 1940s, who's becoming one of those clerics who bridged China with Taiwan and work on the rebirth in the post-colonial Taiwan of a kind of new Buddhism that had developed in the early 20th century China. Zahan's works um, and his, his literature, his, his production is vast and varied. He wrote commentaries of the most popular Buddhist text in the early 20th century China, but also debated the questions of education, Sangha reforms, and the role of nuns in the Buddhist and social communities. Certainly, Tsehan was uh, among the first proposers of Renji and Fojiao. And in these terms, his idea of Buddhism as education should be interpreted. These theories embraced foreign influences, influences, but also attempted to revive and reinforce the traditional essence of Chinese Confucian education and also explicitly Buddhism. These show continuity with the pre-modern era, but also renew appreciation for the Confucian and Buddhist contribution to ethical sustainability in the modern context. After looking at these theories, so on these um, theoretical arguments and debates of how education should be, I will go into Buddhist education in practice and analyze the three examples that I mentioned before. So three categories of education beyond the classroom um, that will appear as the embodiment of intellectual and theoretical debate. So let's start with Zahan. In Zahan's writings, Buddhism is conceived often in terms of, of Jiao Yu education, not just as simply its own Jiao and religion. Zahan listed Buddhism as one of the three main religions available in China, um, and the others were, so the three main religions were 
uh, Buddhism, Christianity, and Islam, the way that he, um, he, he, he framed them, but also look at more local tradition like Taoism. Um, well, more local tradition like Taoism are less included in his, um, um, in, in his writings that he, that he completed. And he also categorized it, Buddhism as a form of national education. Uh, I talk about uh, Guo Jia de Jiao Yu. It is the latter that gives Buddhism the ability to rescue the nation. This idea of rescuing the nation uh, is, is rescuing the nation at the first time, at, at the beginning of a Republican period in, in a new phase of the history of China. It becomes even stronger during the Sino-Japanese conflict. So there is, is a kind of um, very charged expression. Sehan argued, uh, so Buddhism, Christianity, the free principle of the people, uh, some injury of Confucianism that he, um, that he called, well, he talked about Kong Jiao. These are all forms of education and as education, they can rescue the nation. Sehan explained that there are three types of education, the education given within the household, the education given at schools, and then there is the education given within society. And since the religion, Song Zhao, and especially Buddhism, offers guidance to society and compensates for all the deficiencies of the other two forms of education, the one within family and schools, then Buddhism is also an education with societal function and has the ability, again, to rescue the nation. So Han's argument um, definitely revealed the essence of Renjian Fu Zhao, humanistic Buddhism, and it was not an isolated viewpoint. Um, so, so the, the idea that indeed Buddhism can operate within the social sphere and contributed to that. Kaishu also had, of course, very similar arguments. So Tsehan's argument seems to echo Taishu's position from the late 1920s. And, and Taishu also wrote and was very much active in the domain of education. So in 1928, he published an article on Hai Chao In um, that was all about this um, national conference on education that he attended. And, and he firmly endorsed that the Saminjui, the free principle of the people, were the basis for the educational system and not merely a political ideology, but also defined his Renshen Fu Jiao Yu, so his humanistic Buddhist education, as being in line with the new KMT policies. In the same article, Taishu proposed an education um, according to the morality of the, of the great unity. Uh, Tatong, this, this is a very, very important uh, concept. Um, in Confucian tradition. And this education is a formal form of education that also embodied religious values and could thus benefit society overall. Humanistic Buddhism was then defined according to the concepts of societal sustainability and civility embedded by the three principles of the people. So that if it finally became the religious visit, visit, the visitation of a latter. In other words, Taishu's humanistic Buddhism and the KMT three principles of the people were in harmony and proposed similar ideals for education, which were also in line with the education of the Confucian great unity. In the 1920s, others uh, like Taishi and Hua Shenzhou and um, a number of other um, Buddhist uh, monastics of lay um, thinkers uh, start writing about a Buddhistized education so an education that is um, reform uh, and, and, and affected by Buddhist reform, which wanted to reiterate what also Taishu and Sahan in other venues had advanced. Buddhism is an education that has societal function and indeed can contribute to ethical sustainability. And now let's go to Wanayang. Yang. The invasion of Western values into Chinese education practices, including the change of curriculum and religious institution, was not always accepted enthusiastically. In fact, uh, it was often contested too. Within the Buddhist sphere, uh, there is even the monk Tongchu, for instance, was very critical of a secularization of programs that he found in certain Buddhist seminaries. The call for the need to preserve the identity of Chinese education practices and the fear of overrating Western knowledge animated debates in China beyond Buddhism as well. Wan Yang is a nice example in this context, and also for his particular background. He was a native of Nanchon, so Sichuan. He received Chinese traditional Confucian education. In 1913, he enrolled in Nanchon Middle uh, Study Hall. Uh, the Xuetan is one of its um, new um, um, schools that started, especially in the Qin period. After graduation, um, so between 19, uh, 1918 and 1920, one moved to Beijing, where he studied at Beijing University. 
Besides Western philosophy, he took also courses on Indian philosophy, Yogacara, and Sanskrit. Elian Shumi was among um, his teachers. In 1922, after the foundation of the Chinese Metaph Metaphysical Institute, um, Jinan Xue Yuan in Nanjing, Wan Yang moved there and studied with resident scholars like Ouyang Jingbu and Lu Chen. Later in 1925, he became a teacher in the same institution. And a few years later, um, after just a few years in Nanjing, he returned to Nanchon, where he continued his research on Yogacara. And then he, he stayed basically uh, active, except for a short time of period um, in Sichuan. Um, also with the uh, China Metaphysical Institute, but then was moved there in 1937, but starting his own schools. So putting in practice his own ideas of education. I want to expand on um, Wan Yang school here. What is of interest for this talk is um, his view on education, which stressed the ne necessary revaluation of Confucian and Buddhist values as ideal education for a good society, as moral values that would have guaranteed the sustainability of an harmonious, peaceful, and virtuous society. Uh, one wrote two pieces, uh, wrote, uh, one and young wrote several pieces on education, but there are two specific articles that are very important to understand what he meant um, by education. So one is the notes from the Guishan Academy, the Guishan uh, uh, the Guishan Shuyan, and this place, it was one of the schools that he studied in Anchon. And this particular article uh, from the 1930s, is a manifesto of his view on what education should be and reflects his initial motivation to start schools and engage in teaching. The later one, later in 1938, he published another article that is about um, reforms in education. And in this article, which is slightly later than the previous one, he reveals more mature reflections on the contemporary system of education and, and the need of changes. In the schools that he had established in Nanchon and Aijan, so all in Sichuan, Wan Yang combined the teaching of Buddhism and Confucianism. In fact, as he often wrote, his mission was to return main, main attention to Buddhism and Confucianism. This was in line with his perspective on culture and education, a legacy of the May 4th movement and reactions to the adoption of Western thought at the expenses of the own Chinese national cultural identity. And also similar to other initiatives in those years, see, for instance, the um, Tong, uh, Tong Fan Wen Huai and Yuan, the Research Institute of Instant Culture that Tan Taiyuan started in Wuchang. Tan Taiyuan is another very important figure, lay Buddhist, uh, often being seen as part of a Thai Shoes network. According to Wan Yang, education, in terms of systems, content, and scope, reflects his expression of the culture wherein it is embedded. It responds to a frenetic and enthusiastic reception of Western, uh, generally intended as a Sifan culture and education in its values and aims, and to even a replacement of the Chinese traditional perspective with Western ideas. Wan Yang reflects on the main discrepancies between Chinese and, and Western cultures and education, and how Chinese traditional ideas may still be ideal, not just to China, but to guarantee a better humanity in general. Um, when you talk about Western, so Sifan, um, they often just use Western, but then when he goes into detail and, and writes his own examples, he specify America, um, um, Meguo, and, and Europe, Ojo. So he kind of can see that there are different influences and different histories in, in the regional context uh, of, of, of Western civilization. Much of Wan Yang's reflections seem to revive traditional Chinese Confucian views of education with self-cultivation and moral improvement as aim and conducive to the foundation of an harmonious society. Uh, views that were also permeated in the Buddhist sphere, the ethical emphasis on the societal contribution as the monk Zahan has also said in the same years. The name of the institute, the one open in Aijan, um, uh, that was called Tongfang, Wen Zhao Yan Zhou Yuan, they use Tong Fan Wen Zhao, also reveals how in practice he stressed the relevance of Eastern education and culture. He doesn't just write Chinese, he writes Eastern because in his study of Buddhism, he perceived Buddhism as a tradition coming from India. So Wen Zhao, when he refers to the Wen Hua culture, and Zhao stands for Zhao Yu, education. It doesn't stand for Zong Zhao, religion. And Eastern, as I said, is intended as Chinese, but also Indian, thinking of India as a regional place of Buddhism. 
According to Wan Yang, education is the foundation of the country. A prosperous education brings prosperity to the country. A corrupted education, on the other hand, brings corruption to the country. Furthermore, education serves to perfect human virtues with the effect to develop civilization. While promoting a third, so what, what he does is, it's not um, just say Eastern culture and education are good and whatever comes from the West is bad. It's, it's trying to combine and go beyond this binary of East and West. So why he, he promote a third new form of culture and education that surpass the sole promotion of either Chinese or Western values. Wang emphasizes the essence of, of a Chinese education based on Confucian and Buddhist studies, highlighting the complementarity and the successful combination of the two. Here is the education that perfects human virtues and develops civilization. This is the education and culture that does not encourage individualism and exclusion that he saw as characteristic of Western, especially European culture, but rather the idea of an interdependence and, and a not dualistic universe. Buddhism's theory of cause and effect, inguo, and no self are certainly conducive to this. This is how a united and one harmonious family is achieved. The Confucian idea of great unity, Tatong, is highlighted again, like it was in, in Tai Xu and other um, Buddhist educators. And in Wan Yang's writing, um, Tatong and of, of idea, the Confucian idea of a great unity is seen as shared implicitly by Buddhism too. The monk Tai Xu and other promoters of Regen for Jiao, as I said, promote, uh, promoted the same, underlining this um, connection between Confucianism and Buddhism as a key feature of the Regen for Jiao education. But the need of a new culture to, be, uh, to build a new humanity and the new culture have to be based on and encompassing and merging Chinese and non-Chinese. So it was not either, as I said, either Chinese or non-Chinese, but we need something that is encompassing and merging Chinese and non-Chinese. Chinese intending Confucian and Buddhist, past and present traditions and so on. So he used this particular expression to, uh, to, to make sure that he, he wanted to go beyond the binary and create this third form of culture. This was the education, cultural education that using Wan e Yang's terms could have fostered peace for humanities and renaissance of a nation. Wang didn't just try to rescue the lost memory of the effectiveness of Chinese and Buddhist education for the new modern world. He was also aware that the non-Chinese could have not been ignored completely. This is how he proposed a third new culture and education, a new solution for creating a better world, a new system of culture and education in addition to and comprehensive of the two systems of Eastern and Western culture. This was the conclusion that when a young reach after his long-term study of Western and Eastern philosophies a new effort system and a new plan that he wanted to implement in schools, he was either founding or teaching in. This is the third the new system that Wan Yang encouraged not just China, but the entire world to pursue as the only way to also uh, reach a more fruitful and peaceful um, society. And so we can reflect now on how this could also be conducive to um, of, of, of somehow helping uh, this idea of ethical sustainability for a global society. Now. Let's go from theory into practice. After an overview of what Buddhism could teach Chinese society and the interface with Confucian and overall Chinese education and, and how modern theorizers of education have conceived Confucian and Buddhist education as crucial element for ethical sustainability in a global modern society, I will explore some examples of how in practice, Buddhists have embodied lecture these values and spread them beyond the premises of the temples and beyond the classic classrooms. Using the free example, I will, um, I will not discuss the opening um, um, of, the, of the non religious schools and the curriculum for the surrounding communities. As I said, um, um, I will leave that for another talk. Um, but it has to be said that Buddhist temples were also opening these schools, either within the temples or outside the temples, but close to the temples. Uh, for just delivering secular education. They were also creating, and this is something that I found plenty of examples in my research in Sichuan. They were um, creating uh, vocational schools for unemployed. So people were unemployed could learn new skills and from there go and start a new job. So that's something that I found quite peculiar. Um, but we're not gonna talk about this. We're gonna talk about, oh, sorry. We're gonna talk about this free form of teaching. 
teaching and inspiring beyond the classroom space. Now, first is leading by examples. Collection, collections of monks and nuns' biographies presents achievements of a set of Buddhist practitioners that then became exam, exemplars of how Chinese Buddhism wanted to be memorialized. Translation of texts and doctrinal exegesis were key factors in defining eminent Buddhism and eminent Buddhists. However, it was not only through lecturing and preaching that uh, example uh, that model Buddhists left their mark on the communities. Their leadership and welfare intervention in the community has also been highly influential, a practical way to influence and enhance ethical sustainability of a social body. Monastics and laity have led by example and inspired surrounding communities throughout the history of Chinese Buddhism. And in Taiwan, Master Zhen Yan is a clear example of a Buddhist actor, in this case a Buddhist nun, whose compassion, determination, and noble purposes have inspired and attracted millions of followers and guided the accomplishment of welfare activities in Taiwan, Asia, and all over the globe. So being a model uh, led by uh, example is a form of education. It does nurture ethical sustainability, it does nurture moral improvement. Looking at examples in the Republican era, there are many, but what I want to do here is to look at one specific case of a Buddhist nun. Uh, since we not very, not too often, we look at nuns as leaders. When I talk about this nun that, is, um, that uh, not many people know about, uh, that lived between the end of the Qin and, uh, and, uh, and the first part of the Republican period, Fan Chen. She moved to a small temple of Grady in ruins, a temple that, that under her leadership turned into a then celebrated Juins, uh, Juin nunnery. After her death, we made even a big statue and a text commemorating Fan Chan at the temple. And unfortunately, now uh, they are not there anymore. Fan Chan was born in 1941 in a well-known local family and became interested in Buddhism since she was a child. As a monastic, she felt the mission to um, disseminate Dharma and, and save Sashian beings. She preached Mahayana Bodhisattva practice, um, the Pusha Xin, as the only effective form of cultivation. Fan Chong was also following the traditional Chan practice, and she strongly believed in the Pai Chan rules, a day without work is a day without food, and the idea of a self-sustained monastic community rooted in farming labor. Fan Chong visited Zhu in, um, in, in 1874, when it was already abandoning ruins due to the rains and floods from the early 1870s. The water had corroded and destroyed all the statues, which had then become recognizable. She was deeply touched by the devastation of the sacred site and, and also of the village around it, and made the vow to rebuild the temple, return it to lost dignity, and inspire and nurture the surrounding community. Fan Chan moved to Zhu in, uh, in 1876 with two disciples, the nun, uh, Xin Chan and Xin Jie, and some lay people. And then on the way to there, and when she reached um, um, the, the, the village where Zhu in uh, was, um, Another woman accepted to become um, a disciple, said to become ordained and so to become a nun under her, and she became uh, named Sin Chuan. Um, and then also a number of ladies that working with her to rebuild the temple as a way that the temple then was a way to rebuild the village. Savings coming from the nuns farming and various donations from the local community helped the four nuns to give Juins a new life. And by the end of the 1920s, Juin uh, Chan Si. So a Juin Chan temple, Chan Nanari, reached his completion. A large board at the top of the main gate reported the new name in golden ink and the beauty in the decoration of the details, result of the efforts and deep commitments of the four nuns, but also of all the local community, brought fame to Juin Chan Si. And then, and then the temple became very soon very popular and now in Pixian, in this kind of, this is a kind of peripheral um, area uh, within metropolitan, uh, right now is within metropolitan Chengdu. What is important here is that from 1970, 1876 to 1949, Fan Chan, her direct disciples, and the following generations of nuns engaged in three main kinds of activities, which were mostly charity related, but also education related. Well, um, First of all, the distribution of rice and other goods as aid to the poor, with involvement of even local political figures in the rice and food collection. Then the distribution of medicine to the needy. And finally, and finally, um, the annual temple fair on the seventh day of the seventh month of the lunar calendar, where the nuns lecture on Buddhist teachings, text, 
so educating, and especially the spirit of the Chan tradition, as Chan essence and the Bodhisattva practice were clearly the pillars in uh, Fan Chan's cultivation and the practice that she promoted at Juin's. Uh, but Anne Fan Chan was very attracted by the rural area and the possibility to continue the equal emphasis on meditation and farming that is also a traditional feature of Chan school. She transmitted this spirit to the future generation of nuns, but also to the families living in the village and working in the temple's fields. And even now, um, with the reopening of a nunnery after the long closure that started in the beginning of the 1950s, and despite the more modern, the reduced appearance of the temple complex, the nuns are active in the surrounding fields, helped by local farmers, and sustain themselves with vegetables that they themselves grow. The picture that you see here is um, on one of the courtyard of the temple as it is today. Thanks to the presence of Anchon, Chu Ins uh, became a center of inspiration and moral guide guidance for the family living in the surrounding. So a site where Bodhisattva values were taught, a site that educated and still educates the laity. And I felt the same atmosphere during my visit, uh, my last visit in August 2019. Interesting to note that the temple shows posters and other material on Confucian virtues and teachings as further evidence of the interface between the latter and Buddhism when it comes to promote individual moral cultivation, which would then lead to a better society. Monastics turning prayers into action, making the essence of the Bodhisattva spirit manifest through concrete assistance to the community. This is a, a successful way to teach Buddhist principle, to teach values through their embodiment. I'm talking, I've talked about this particular nunnery, but just saying in Sichuan, a number of nuns in the training area, uh, so more the eastern part of the province, we're doing the same, and so many more monastics. But it's important to note at the time where the history of Buddhism tends still to be very much about the male Sangha, the Buddhist women and nuns were all active participants in social welfare and ethical guidance and education. And as such, they're still remembered by the local communities. Now let's look at the second practical example that I wanna talk about, lecturing uh, the army. So Dharma for the army. In my research on Buddhism in modern Sichuan, I've also analyzed the effects of the Sino-Japanese conflict of the interaction between the Sangha and the laity and future development of another instance of education from the laity um, um, to the public sphere. A better way to bring, in this case, the public sphere into the temple and turn the temple into a school for soldiers. Starting from the late 1920s, but especially from the mid late 1930s, not only governmental offices and intellectuals moved from Nanjing to the southwest, but military academies were also transferring what is today Sichuan and Chongqing, local Taoist temples like Qinyangong and Buddhist monastery like Pao Wanzi and Cao Tanzi that were um, the major monastery in the Republican period of Chengdu, hosted those military schools. Certainly, turning the temples into military schools and camps was instrumental for the survival of the sacred sites in those years of turmoil. But we are referring to uh, more than 13,000 students, uh, military students, all lay soldiers who spent eight years in Sichuan. And members of the army didn't only need residential and practice, a place for practice, but were also in need of support and moral instructions, which members of the Sangha delivered. Close relations between the army and the Buddhist monastic community can also be detected, of course, outside Sichuan and before the Sino-Japanese conflict. In these years, troops uh, resided in monastery. Generals often requested monks and Buddhist lay teachers to lecture the army and the rest of the local community on various subjects, mostly from pure land text to um, Yogacara philosophy. And we also have the instance of military figures eventually sponsoring the creation of Buddhist seminary for the education of young monks. So um, militaries that were educated and benefited from these teachings of the Buddhist then returning um, and, and through sponsorship to improve the education of the monks. Teachings including meditation session, lectures on tenets, um, important concepts of the Buddha Dharma, and of course the Ingo uh, cause and effect and the idea of the interconnectedness was the major one. Um, but also lecture on texts like the Diamond Sutra, the Amitabha Sutra, the Sutra of Perfect Enlightenment and the Pumenti in the chapter of Universal Gateway. And of course, given the time, a number of metaphors on who won the protection of the country with, um, with country intended as pure land and so teaching on karma and inguo and, and, and teaching on preserving the country as a way to preserve Buddhism and preserving the country, preserving Buddhism as the same topic. Troops outside Sichuan were also instructed by Sangha members and even eminent monks like Yuan or uh, Chan Xin and lay intellectuals like Ouyang Jinbu 
uh, were among the teachers. This was moral upbringing. It was a way to perfect human virtues, to borrow one of expressions, and a way to explain the interconnectedness within humanity. The military eventually showed deep and deepest interest in Buddhism due to the close presence of the Sangha. Uh, for instance, the uh, famous army general Fan Yuxian, uh, who was not Buddhist, wrote poems, poems about Pao Wanzi after he stayed there. And these poems are highly revered by um, the temple. And young soldiers ended up even converting to Buddhism. And some of them in the, uh, became monks after all. I'm gonna show you a photo here. Uh, this is from Pao Wanzi in Chengdu. So if you go to Pao Guanzi now, uh, Pao Guanzi is one of the monasteries that hosted the military in the late 1930s and when monks were lecturing the soldiers, there are huge posters within the temple with picture, historical pictures, pictures of uh, monks doing, uh, well, of soldiers living there. Uh, these are just some of them. And then, but then also at the same time, monks have to do other particular learning, secular learning, like uh, first aid, rescue, courses because it was a wartime. But it's very interesting that the temple is exposing these pictures as a very important part of their history. Another third example um, that is uh, the Dharma into prisons. I will start with just some um, general consideration be before going to um, kind of historical, uh, the chronology of when this practice started and how it developed, especially in the modern time that the Buddha Dharma provided moral teachings that could have helped prisons inmates rectify their behavior was well known since the imperial time, even before the time period. And since the first occasion, two main points emerge. First of all, that Buddhism could um, correct the inmates um, so that the evil that they were dying could transform into goodness. Um, so they, they could, actually improve, um, they, they could repent, correct their behavior and, and, and starting new and started as a, a good virtuous people. But then there was the idea of suffering or cool. So the suffering that um, the inmates were receiving or um, experiencing because of what they were doing, because of what they had done that led them to prison and also the life in prison. So Buddhism on one hand could help the inmates to overcome the suffering caused by their crimes and the current life in prisons, but also could help to turn this kind of evil into goodness. And of course, it's the turning the evil into goodness, into virtues, that was the major uh, aspect of, um, of what Buddhism tried to do. Now, as I said, this is something that started also in the pre-modern time. So about pre-modern China, Um, indeed, the fifth century Buddhists have provided this support. So starting from the fifth century, the first documented instances of Buddhists providing assistance to convicted um, to inmates in Chinese prisons date back to the Northern Wei dynasties to the mid fifth century. And we didn't have in this case monastics entering prisons technically, but offenders were brought into temples, which were seen as venues uh, that provide um, education that could reform them. So this idea of reforming educa an education that could reform uh, the convicted and a force for the stability of society. When serious offenders were transferred to the temple temporarily, they were called fotuhu or suhu to indicate they were staying inside the temple properties and taking, undertaking tasks like cleaning the temples, working in the temples, lands properties. They were also defined as temple slaves. But it was a way for them to uh, repent and to learn values and virtues. Different scenario, slightly different scenario, um, uh, with pra but practices with similar aims are recorded during the Swain and especially later in the time period. Here monastics didn't enter prisons either, but then you have the creation of the foundation of Bihara. Um, they were built under offices of, of supervisory affairs. Um, one important one is this, the Yushetai, and then and 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 Wu Zetian, Empress Wu Zetian, uh, is something that was is, is some it's, it's really promoted that in in Chan'an. So she created the, the Bihara. Or she wanted to open up a Bihara next to this office where inmates could uh, work, uh, learn about Buddhism, being guided by Buddhist and Buddhism, and try to repent their own mistakes and to make a change in their lives. So for Zhao, Buddhism could Ganhua could reform. Um, there is this particular document that, um, that explains actually what happened in that Vihara. They, um, 
Dan Yu Shi Tai Jin Shi Pei, and uh, you can read more in this um, in this pay of um, the different activities that were done there and and what kind of improvement were happening um, and when living in the Vihara. And it's interesting that this is one of the first instances where you start uh, use the term Vihara as the Buddhist place. But then you have a big change starting in the Qing period. And, and it was implemented late Qing, and it was implemented especially during the Republican period. This is when the Buddhist Sangha started entering prisons premises. And not only Buddhism, but other religious tradition could enter and teach in prison. And this was decided in the code that I mentioned here, the Taqing Jian Yu Yu Cao Yan, Cao An, um, which is this, this particular draft, uh, the prison's regulation of the Qin dynasty. Lei Qin it was written, drafted in, in 1910, and, and they gave provision to whatever should have happened in this reform. Uh, prisons, but also the possibility to have education and religious instruction. This um, Zhao Hui, that is very first term that you find here, is what is always used, is often used to identify the kind of religious um, teaching that could have done by different groups. So it was a way, it, it, it was kind of line out possibility to have religious instructions, but also to have liturgies and rituals in prisons. Republican era uh, made other codes uh, in 1914, 1928, 1946, for, for instance, but they, were, they are seen by uh, experts uh, in the study of prisons in China as merely revision of the late Qing code. On the other hand, the Republican prisons didn't just inherit regulation for the late Qing, but were also emulating what had happened abroad, namely the prisons reforms that you have seen in Japan and several Western nations. And hence, similarly to what we see in other spheres of, new, of the new Chinese nation, Japanese and Western cultures of reforms are evaluated, are fulfilled, and eventually adopted. In 1913, it was decided that religion really should have been used in prisons for moral instruction. And the very first reform prison, the Beijing number one prison that was established in 1912, um, started this practice. Two decades later, in 1935, the Nanjing government issued a new document stating that inmates could have requested in the religious personnel as preachers and counselors. Several religious um, traditions were accepted, and, and we have evidence that instructions of Taoism, Christianity, Buddhism, and Islam were all made available and given. Portraits of founders or relevant figures of this religious tradition are also hung inside the prisons. Needless to say, the presence of Buddhist judges or even Buddhist ministry of justice like Jujan, for instance, were instrumental in concretizing this plan. And in the years where Jujan was a minister of justice, um, and so it were years where you see more and more presence of Buddhism within prison. More specifically about Buddhism, Buddhist and secular journals publish several articles that explain how Buddhism could have intervened positively on the correction of criminal offenders, monks who were sent to prison with these tasks, which a sermon of Buddhist texts were used in these meetings, information of Buddhist organization that were funded, uh, founded with the scope of transmitting Buddhist tenets for more cultivation of criminal offenders, and also records the, uh, of uh, that particular monk went there and gave this talk and, and how many people and what was the effect on the inmates. These are just some screenshots of a few articles from the Republican period, but there are plenty in the, in the Republican database. So there was an, a lot of also writings about this practice. It's interesting to note that as folk Buddhism was not the only religious belief present in prison, it was probably the most popular one. Sources report that in 1922, the renewed library included in the first reform prison approved by the Minister of Justice contained uh, 4,383 volumes, and of these, 2,070 were Buddhist. So more than 47% of the total were Buddhist. In the, and in the recent work, um, the scholar Ming Chenman uh, indicated that besides books, there were just kind of three main ways of Buddhist intervention in prison in the Republican period. In prison and in the life of inmates, lecture, um, so through lectures and teaching practice, meditation practice, but also um, intervention can contribute to the well-being of the inmates. And certainly lecturing and Buddhist practice can be labeled as education practices. 
several different where we do this practice education activities running prisons. You have normal lectures, uh, classes, curriculum, various topics of Buddhism, sermons, exegesis of text, Nienfo practices, Buddhist chanting, and or even just self-reading of Buddhist books. There were there were plenty of them and in the Buddhist library in the libraries of the prison. The scope was to put Buddhism on the front line and the reform Ganghua of the prison, dissolved as a, they this is, this is an expression that is used very often, dissolved um, dissolve the evil and develop goodness from the prisons. Monks were lecturing on how to develop humanness, um, and Jetao. And, and this was reiterated, and this was just reiterating the traditional Confucian view mentioned earlier, because Zoran Jatao, this particular expression, is something that you find especially in, um, in Confucian spheres. Learning Xue was the tool path to become fully human. Learning was a process of personal cultivation implying the acquisition of the virtuous conduct. Um, there is a very nice article written in the Republican period where a monk um, is just the writing down um, of a speech of this monk. And he said, you know, you have to think of life like trains and trains go through tracks and you have to make sure that the train follow the tracks because otherwise, um, and then you have a train accident and life is the same and you need to be on track and the law intended us you know, national law, the law of China, and is helping you to be on track. And, and, and Buddhist, and, and, and then you mentioned a number of Buddhist ideal uh, notions and Confucian ideas that can help you to stay on track. Long uh, was the list of books used by Sangha members in their lectures or, or that were just found in the library. And here I just put the list of some of them. And of course, myself, you see there are a number of them actual, um, about Pure Land, but also you have Agama, you have um, the Bodhisattva practice text. And then I found that, of course, you have also Beren Wanjin, um, and the, 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 the Sutra for the Humane King, that is, um, that is, that is a very important sutra, especially in the Republican period. Different provinces in China, from Zhenjiang to Jiangsu, Jiangxi, uh, and Sichuan, created their own model within this general framework of participation of Buddhist and Buddhist teachings in prison. Several monks, including the famous, Mark, uh, the famous reformer Tai Xu, uh, were all active in this mission. Um, there is a very long article in one of the Republican journal um, written, well, it was the speech that Tai Xu gave about Inguo, about cause and effect, and really Inguo and the idea of karma. Um, and it is, it's probably the most popular uh, topic for lectures that were done um, in, in, in prisons at that time. And then there is Sichuan. And we talk about Sichuan because more recently that's um, the province that I've been looking at, especially for the Republican period. So in Sichuan, you have a Sichuan number one prisons where you have um, uh, in, in, in the Republican, what's especially uh, the mid and Republican era, you have five, 600 inmates that start following Buddhism and more than 400 became Buddhist in the sense that they even take refuge in Buddha Dharma Sangha. And then I also wanna talk about this particular monk, Chan Yuan. Uh, he's again, another monk that is not very well known um, among modern Chinese Buddhism, but he was, uh, he was a big leader. He was a president also of the Sichuan chapter of the Chinese Buddhist Association. He became the vice president of the National Buddhist Association. Tai Xu really wanted him uh, in the thirties. He was one of the most active and fundamental monks in the province since, 1920, since 1920s and until his passing in 1945. And one of the main educators and founders of schools in the Chengdu area. He started visiting prisons um, and founders of schools and schools for nuns as well. He started visiting prisons, um, different prisons. So for some prisons, he was going there on Tuesdays, Tuesdays and Sundays, also with other monks, and he was explaining and spread the Buddhist message. And then uh, from 1944, um, the monk Guangwen, that Guangwen was also another very important monk in Sichuan at that time. He was one of the teacher in several, for Xuyan, in several uh, Buddhist um, seminaries or other schools that were open at that time for monastics. He had replaced um, Chan Yuan in this endeavor. By 1945, in the only site in Sichuan uh, where he was, um, where Chan Yuan was active, more than 60 inmates wanted to become Buddhist and become Buddhist taking him as a teacher. Another reason why I use him as, as, as an example is because 
is why Chai Yuan became a monk. Uh, Chai Yuan was, when he was just a little boy, he was working in the fields next to Juin, Se, the nunnery that I mentioned before. And then he was looking at Fang Chan, the nun Fang Chan, all the other nuns, their behavior, their attitude, their um, compassionate um, action, acting and presence in, in, in the surrounding society. And he was very much inspired. And because of that, he became a monk. So again, this is a proof that leading by example uh, can really affect society. A final thing that I want to mention is the kind of a, the Republican institutions of this practice to have Dharma in prisons. Um, so you have uh, the foundation of a number of local and national society. The major one is certainly the Chinese Prison Dharma Propagation Society. Um, I use uh, this, kind, this English translation, the Zhongguo Jiu Hong Fa Shi. And this is a further example of institutionalization of this practice. It was established towards the end of the Republican period in 1946, although it was planned between 1941 and 1935. So it um, took quite some time of planning. It was a nationwide association and institution. So it was active uh, in, in different provinces. But there are other similar structures that started much earlier. Um, they were operational within a more limited territory. Um, and then, that, for instance, with the Shanghai Prison Reform Association, Shanghai Jiu uh, Gang Huang Hui, founded in 1925, and also others in Hangzhou and Hefei. So these are associations uh, were not were mostly led by laity, and so laity were kind of managing, were receiving um, donations, uh, and and were very active in printing Buddhist books, sending books to the, the libraries of the prisons, and then taking notes of, and also organizing monastics going into the prison and deliver lectures. So um, it was quite a, a big enterprise. And it is interesting that it's not just a monastic enterprise, but the lady has a big role. So to conclude, um, so we have talked about pre-modern time, the Republican period, but what's happening today? Buddhist groups supplementing education matters, the so-called Jushue, um, or organization establishing all religious schools from elementary level to college and graduate research institutes, Buddhist chaplaincy in the army, Buddhist instructions in prisons, from reading and listening groups to meditation retreats, these interventions in society, this contribution to the ethical sustainability have been present in the Chinese world even after the Republican period and are still visible today. Much of the force behind it is the charisma of leading Buddhist groups, also like previous eminent man, uh, Sangha uh, members, led by example. And much is labeled as expression of Renjian Fujiao, humanistic Buddhism. So it's still part of this kind of humanistic Buddhism discourse. The instance of Master Jian and the manifestation um, in concrete actions by the Zhiji world is a good representation of how the heritage of social welfare and Buddhist instructions pers uh, persist today. Their work in prisons, just to mention one of my case studies, expands to a few continents. It's not just something happening in Asia. And in prisons, Zhiji lay members, other than monastics, underlines the notion of karma, the idea of being all interconnected, the role of compassion, they refer to canonical scriptures, but they also use and distribute the books of aphorism of Master Zhen Yen, books that, due to Zhen Yen's charisma and leadership, are authoritative as the Buddha Bachana. And here is um, just the screenshot of one of, of from, from one of the different websites of the G, uh, talking about one particular activities in the U uh, US prisons. And then you can see that. There is the Nafonism of Master Zhen Yen, but the kind of narrative that you read here is very much close to what has happened in the pre-modern and modern time, this idea of virtuosity, virtues and values that are shared, that are Buddhist, but can also, are also shared by, um, by, by, by the Confucian tradition. So what is happening uh, today is also echoing the traditional Confucian concept of education in China. Education is a way, is a Tao, to develop the moral character of a student, a student that is also a citizen, and eventually the integration of the individual into the own social environment to build an harmonious society. Here is when personal and inner cultivation were connected to and became functional for the surrounding uh, community, whether it is the great unity or uh, the pure land on earth, Nanjian Jintu, 
It is a society founded on ethical responsibility. The same protagonists of Eren Jen Fojal discourse integrate the Buddhist lessons with Confucian sayings and wisdom too. This spirit, of course, extends beyond China, reaching the Western world. And these spirits become even more relevant in a present and future society and the prospect of global citizenship with, the, with all the challenges that global citizenship can bring. Wan Yang's views on Confucian and Buddhist contribution to ethical sustainability, his third new cultural education, as well as the way that the monk Tsuhan positioned Buddhism and its potentials within the education sector could be relevant to the contemporary global world. And I would conclude with Wan Yang's phrasing, Chinese education intended as synergy of Confucianism and Buddhism can contribute an important lesson to the rest of the world. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Travagnin, for such a wonderful and informative explanation of um, all the different ways that Buddhist education has made contributions to all these different areas, both historically and today um, in China and now beyond. Um, so now we can move to the discussion period. Uh, as I mentioned, unfortunately, Professor um, Chin Long Lin is unable to join us today. However, um, I am going to say a few words of introduction um, because he was the one who actually prepared the comments. Um, so I will, uh, so he, um, Dr. Chin Long Lin is the CEO of the Buddhist Tsuchi Medical Foundation and the CEO of the Tsuchi International Medical Association. Dr. Lin has inspired many in the health sector as a driver of environmental responsibility. Dr. Chin Long Lin is dedicated to convening a broad coalition of local government, civil societies, hospital systems, and medical professionals to transform from environmental hazards to environmental stewardship. We are lucky, however, to be joined by Dr. Ming Nan Lin, um, who will deliver the comments on Dr. Lin's behalf. Dr. Ming Nan Lin is currently the Vice Superintendent at the Da Lin Tsuchi Hospital at the Tsuchi Medical Foundation in Taiwan. He has a master's degree in public health and has devoted himself to community outreach and international disaster relief. He's also an assistant professor at Tsuchi University in Hualien, Taiwan, and promotes health and holistic, with a holistic approach. As the pre president of the Taiwan Vegetarian Nutrition Society and the chair of the task force on health promoting hospital and environment, he aspires to see hospitals achieve the goals of health and environmental protection. So I will invite um, Dr. Lin to comment. Um, uh, did you want to say something first, Dr. Uh, Mr. Herb? Uh, thank you, uh, Vicky, for your kind introduction. And then also thanks for profession, uh, Professor Stephanie's excellent speech. Yeah, it opened, uh, really opened my eyes from the historical view of Buddhist teaching beyond the temple. And uh, as a physician in Buddhist Tsuji Hospital, I'm the one benefit from uh, Buddhist teachings and learn a lot from it. Uh, medicine is a profession of uh, hands-on hand uh, teaching and learning from mentor to uh, disciples. It is a profession of helping uh, peoples. Yeah, in medical teaching, we have to learn many knowledge and skills from a formal medical curriculum, but we know that Hidden curriculum is the most, one of the most important factors for young doctors to become good doctors. So this is also lead by example, show by example. And then we call uh, Buddha Da Yi Wang, the great physicians. Buddha most uh, uh, Buddha most teach uh, healing the mind and spirits of human beings. So I think that uh, uh, Buddhism is uh, also a uh, 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 professional uh, uh, regions of helping others and also can help uh, ourselves. So I would like to share uh, from the medical perspective uh, on this uh, Buddha's teaching via the temples. May I share my screen? Okay. Okay. Um, Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from a uh, friend from all over the world. Um, I'm Dr. Minanin from Buddhist Study in Tsuji Hospital. On behalf of uh, CEO of Buddhist Tsuji Medical Foundation, Dr. Jinong Lin, I'm honored to share 
the thought of teaching of Buddhist, Buddhism of Tzu Foundation uh, humanize the Buddhist teaching and teach others by the example. Tzu Foundation was established by Dhamma Master Zheng Yan in the year 1966. In Chinese, Tzu means compassion, means relief. So Tzu is to relief with compassion. Master Zheng Yan is a disciple of Venerable Master Yin Sun. Uh, Master Yin Sun gave uh, Master Zheng Yan two sentences uh, for the sheikh of Buddhism and for the sentient beings. Uh, since the establishment of Tzu Foundation, Master Zheng Yan carried out its work in this world through four missions. That is charity, medicine, education, and humanistic culture. As shown in the pictures, you can see our commissioner under the call of Master Zheng Yan leave their footprint around the world. These are the four major missions. Furthermore, considering ongoing efforts in bone marrow donation, environmental protection, community, voluntarism, and international relief, these eight concurrent campaigns are collectively known as Tzuji Eight Footprint. There are now a branches office of Tzuji in uh, there's 66 countries and provide services uh, to 126. Currently now is 126 country. So we have office around the world helping people in need. Since I'm working in Tsuji hospitals, I would like to share my experience in Tsuji Medical Foundation. The mission of Tsuji Medical Foundation is to respect life to provide patient-centered care. There are now seven hospitals around Taiwan providing medical services. Besides hospital, the International Medical Association, TIMA, uh, made up of more than 10,000 doctors, nurses, medical technicians, pharmacists, and volunteers in 24 countries and conduct medical outreach services. As you can see, uh, we conduct uh, more than 17,000 medical outreaches and then uh, ben ben uh, benefits more than 3 million people around the world. Uh, this is the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, if you want to reach the 16 goals listed for the first 16 goals, Engage with partnership is the most important way to achieve that. Through altruistically help each other, then we have chance to have a world without poverty, zero hunger, a good health and quality education and so forth. So a partnership, that is the education partnership with others, with each others is very important to achieve the sustainable goals. This is what Dhamma Master Zheng Yan said to us, uh, to walk on the Bodhisattva's path. So when uh, Master Zheng Yan was young, she always, uh, since uh, the establishment of Zhi Abod, Master Zheng Yan and her disciples followed the rule of one day without work is one day without food. Back to 50 years ago in Taiwan, she visited the poor household by household. Tzuji paid attention not only to the effectiveness of its aid and assistance, it also focuses on bring, bringing out the good in everyone. By helping the poor, the rich get to feel the happiness of giving and find the true meaning of life. Likewise, the poor are motivated to harbor love abundantly and help out those less fortunate than themselves, so that they break away from perceived help, helplessness and despair. Consequently, more people become willing to help out others while enriching themselves through uh, contribution. In cognitive neuroscience, there are, you, 
uh, we know that there are mirror neuron system in human brain. One of the important function of mirror neurons is a neural basis of human capacity for emotion such as empathy. Leading by example is also what I witnessed in Ciji. This is our CEO, uh, Dr. Lin Junno. Now he is 78 years old. You can see him not only in hospital, but also in patients' homes, seeing patients, cleaning houses for the poor and helping the victim in disaster domestically and internationally. This is in a uh, 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 fraud. Uh, in, uh, that is in Mona Fengzai. It is a, a flood in southern part of Taiwan, uh, which uh, take away hundreds of lives. This is our CEO, Dr. Lin, with two other uh, hospital superintendent from Taizong and also Dalin. And also, this is international uh, this, uh, uh, medical missions. This is from the Tari refugee camp in Jordan. <coughs> Our, uh, our CEO always lead us uh, to see the patients and also the medical students helping translation for our CEO. That will also plant the seeds of love in the heart of them and then also in the heart of the one in need. You can also see that uh, because when in the re refugee camp, they, they, they don't have the chance to see uh, uh, doctors. When we went there, my experience is that you can, you, as you can see that a, a, a boy with a, a five years old boy, they have a hernia, but no treatment. So when we go there and then we, we check them and then we can refer them to the local hospital uh, by our uh, uh, commissioners to help them to get the, this kind of operation not only for a medical mission, but also we will help to distribution as some goods for the poor, for the people in need. And this is also our CEO, uh, Dr. Lin. There is a train uh, uh, accident uh, this year. And then he himself, he uh, rushed to the scene and, and as a, a, a com, uh, comment, all, uh, all the help, uh, not only from uh, the, 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 the doctors and also some uh, uh, rescue personnel that organize to help the people in the train accident. Yeah, I think that uh, this is why we have TIMA members around the world doing the same relief with compassion. This is... Uh, uh, this is what we learned from, uh, from the examples. Uh, Dharma Master Zheng Yan has always kept in mind what the master, Dharma uh, Master Yin Sun told her to work with Buddhism and all living beings. This has become her lifelong mission and also the mission of Ciji. Uh, master Zheng Yan's lay and monastic uh, disciples also keep these words in their heart as they promote the full mission and a footsteps to emulate the Buddha's heart and take master's mission as our own mission. This is practicing the Buddha Sava's way to benefit all beings, not just to benefit oneself, but to give up to others with loving, kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. equanimity. So I think that uh, as from a medical uh, professional uh, views, uh, Buddhist, uh, that there's a a truism and also lead by example is what I learned from Ciji. Then I think that, uh, thanks uh, uh, Professor Stavinia, uh, that uh, give us the example from uh, the historical view. And I think that um, Buddhist teaching is not only for uh, themselves, for himself, but also to helping others to become better. That is the way that uh, as a, a Buddhist that we can, uh, we can do and hopefully that uh, the world will become better. Thank you. Thank you so much for providing those remarks and for all the wonderful work that you do. Um, it never fails to amaze me just the wide reach and the compassion of, of Tsuchi. So uh, very much appreciated. 
Um, now I'd like to invite Dr. Andre La Liberté to provide some more remarks. Uh, Dr. La Liberté is a professor at the School of Political Studies and the co-director of the Research Chair in Taiwan Studies at the University of Ottawa here in Canada. His research interests include the role of religions in the shaping of social policies in East Asia and the state-religion uh, state religion relations in Chinese societies. Uh, Dr. La Liberté? Uh, good morning and good evening, everyone, wherever you are. I am most grateful for this invitation to comment on the work of my colleague, Afen. I want to thank you all for extending me this invitation to share my thoughts with you. I have been working on the issue of Buddhist philanthropy for years, and I was very much looking forward to learning more about the very fascinating research about religion during the Republican period in Sichuan by Stefania and her team. I'm aware that the Incheng lecture series wants to promote our understanding about the role of Buddhism in contemporary society. And certainly it is important to know about the work of Buddhists the world over in these very difficult times. I've seen the work of Tsuji in Taiwan firsthand for the last 25 years. I've also followed for 15 years how Buddhists in China and abroad have found inspiration from its activities. What was less known until now among scholars of that tradition is the rich trove of experiences accumulated by the Sangha and Li Buddhists for centuries. Colleagues assemble by Wang Jia have provided us with a very rich study of philanthropy since the early centuries of Buddhist presence in China, but there are very few fine-grained studies in English that document such activities before 1949. Moreover, if it is possible to reconstruct the lives of Buddhist philanthropists in centers of political power, such as Beijing and Nanjing, or trading hubs with the wider world, such as Shanghai and Guangzhou, there exists far fewer studies about Sichuan deep in the interior. Thanks to the work of Stefania Travagnin and her team, we are now starting to close that gap. It is important to know more about the Republican period examined by my colleague which brings back to life key moments in a long tradition of Buddhist philanthropy that took new forms and became more visible to society. Through the work of colleagues such as Stefania, it is also the work of many of our Chinese colleagues that are brought to light. And it is important to know about that period of modern history because its ramification outside of China after 1949 largely ignored or unseen for decades, have contributed to the renewal of Buddhist philanthropy. It is important to know more about what Buddhist philanthropy could do in a period of recent Chinese history, when the country was divided at war and faced numerous calamities such as famine, natural disaster and acute poverty. To see the achievements of Buddhist lay volunteers and monastics then in difficult circumstances can give inspiration today about what can be done in China and elsewhere when possibilities are greater in that country. But the challenges of all sorts, including natural disasters caused by climate change are becoming so important. One thing that my colleague made clear is how much the Buddhist Sangha and lay people understood the importance of Buddhist education to provide ethical guidance. I would add that the focus on showing by example, as well as the teaching of the Dharma to the military and prisons represented an important illustration of how Buddhists contributed to protect the nation during the Republican era in a way that was compatible with their ideal of compassion in a time of uncertainty and torment. When the new China emerged in 1949, many Buddhists sincerely believed that this formidable legacy would help them survive. However, the tragedy of the first 30 years of the new China 
was that the government in Beijing refused to appreciate that and inflicted on Buddhists a long series of disasters. The idea that religion could not support the government in fostering education, healing the sick, alleviate poverty, or even provide relief to victims of natural disasters represented a tragic waste of the goodwill of all those who had wanted to share their love and compassion and turn it into good deeds. For 30 years, even thinking of the tradition that developed in the Republican era of Buddhist philanthropy was very difficult. Thankfully, for those who care about the survival of Chinese Buddhism and about the possibility of turning the idea of humanistic Buddhism into a lived reality, it became possible for monastics and lay Buddhists who took refuge in Taiwan and elsewhere to keep the tradition alive. After two decades, it became possible to see the idea of Buddhist education as described in my colleague's presentation to become a reality. Buddhist philanthropy in Taiwan, as you all know, gained visibility with the involvement of Tzu in healthcare with its network of hospitals throughout the island. It contributed to Buddhist education in two novel ways that lay Buddhists discussed by my colleague could not even anticipate. First, they successfully obtained accreditation of their nursing medical college founded in 1994, into Atsuji University in 2000. Secondly, they contributed to rebuild 51 schools after the 1999 earthquake that struck central Taiwan. These milestones in Buddhist education provide inspiration to fellow Buddhists who live in Southeast Asia and the world over. In China, Buddhist education is, for now, limited to the Sangha, as the government does not accept any other form of religious education. Although this cannot fulfill the promise of Buddhist education that existed in Republican China, it nevertheless represents an important foundation for the survival of the tradition and its ability to develop philanthropy in other domains. The policies of Jiang Zemin after 1992 and the ideal of Hu Jintao for a harmonious society have represented a period of two decades with significant promises for Buddhist education. Many of us are starting to appreciate that this period represented a relatively positive stage in recent history. Buddhist temples reopened, the numbers for ordained monks and nuns increased, lay leaders such as Zhao Puchu and the abbots of Nanputuo Temple in Xiamen or the Jade Buddha Temple in Shanghai became well-known and popular personalities. In 2012, for the first time in modern Chinese history, a national Buddhist charity association registered and became recognized for its contribution to help the less fortunate. This event represented the crowning achievement of years in which local temples and lay Buddhists created merit societies, foundations, and associations that assisted the government in meeting the needs of people who faced difficulties such as disability, isolation, or poverty. They assisted orphans and provided support for their education by delivering scholarship. They lend moral support to lone elderly without children and they cared for people suffering from conditions such as leprosy. Most dramatically, they organized fundraising to send relief when natural calamities such as the Sichuan earthquake in 28 brought misery to communities and even provided much needed psychological comfort for people saddened by the loss of loved ones. It has been difficult since the last two years to undertake research in China for outsiders because of the restrictions imposed by the COVID-19 pandemic. But thankfully, we can count on the online connections of our Chinese colleagues who continue to cooperate with us in uncovering 
the evidence of Buddhist philanthropy during the Republican period and the connections with more recent activities throughout the country. I am thankful for the work that Stefania and her colleagues have made available for us to see. And I'm especially curious about the activities of Le Buddhist charity associations beyond the sphere of education. I am looking forward knowing more about what you have seen, dear colleague, in Chongqing and the surrounding area. For example, I'm curious about whether the region has seen uh, other philanthropists who could compare with Wang Yiting and his association in Shanghai, or there in Sichuan groups of Buddhist volunteers who could organize and provide healthcare and medical assistance to civilian victims of warfare, the way the Red Swastika Society in Eastern China did. I am sure many in the younger generations of Chinese Buddhists would like to recover that part of their heritage and learn from it so that it can offer their contribution to contemporary society. I hope I will have a chance to read your research on that fascinating period very soon. Thank you very much for sharing your work with us today. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Laliberté, for providing those, uh, those wonderful comments. Um, I'm going to invite all of the panelists to turn on their cameras now. And just before we move to a general discussion, I'd just like to give uh, Professor Chavagnin a chance to respond to the comments, um, if you'd like. Yeah, thank you very much um, to both of you, to Dr. Lin, uh, to, to the two Dr. Lins uh, that are here today, and, 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 and Andre. Um, I have to say that I, um, I, I spoke to um, Dr. Lin Chinglong uh, a month ago, um, and now today you, you show this, this PowerPoint and these photos, and I realized that the photos that you show me of him are photos that I've seen a long time ago that I might even use in some of my work on Zuji, but I never realized it was him. So it's kind of give me really, make me really move to see him in action besides he talking very enthusiastically about his work and the work of the, of, of the medical profession. So thank you for showing that. And for also now I have the name and a voice associated to, to both photos. Um, and, and you said something that is very important. The Buddha is, is an educator, religious leader, and, and has many titles and definitely is a physician. Uh, many philosophers, even in the West, in, in, in the um, early period that they were interested in, in philosophy and medicine. So there is this kind of connection between medicine and philosophy. And, and indeed, Buddha was um, or is seen as a physician. And, and, and the way that he's also explaining that the form of truth or other teachings has always been also been um, expressed and explained metaphorically through uh, medical examples. So yes, indeed. And I, and I, and I, I agree with you that Buddhism can help the medical professions. And at the same time, the medical, the, the, the doctors, and, and, and it's not just the doctors, but it, what you show is, is, a, is a kind of very uh, large uh, definition of medicine. So going to the place in need and even give the bag of rice, I think it's more than just giving the bag of rice. It's the smile of a gym member giving the bag of smile. So there are, that is also a form of medicine, more maybe psychological, but really help. So there are different kinds of, I mean, the medical profession can be shared by different individuals in, in different capacities. And, and, and definitely, I do see Buddhist teachings helping doctors in the work that they are doing. And, and, and also doctors including Buddhist teachings in, 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 in their own professions. And, and, so, and leading by example, because you, you have shown how clearly Master Jayen, and it's something that I also said in my talk, is, is, a, is, a, is a good uh, example of leading by example. Um, a very charismatic leader that was able to uh, unite all these followers and, and do and, and what, what she actually did. Uh, I have to say that when I was taking notes, I was using this pen, and it's a pen that Master Jayen gave me uh, two years ago. It's made of recycled material. So she was explaining to me the importance of recycle and the, the protection of environment, which is a very important mission also in the G. Um, mm -hmm. And as you said, altruism, leading by example. And indeed, monks are educating in different ways. 
laity are also a very important part. And also Andres said in charity, and indeed the ladies are, and, and Buddhist laity, but also ladies that I, and this I think is also interesting in the G and kind of resonate with the kind of message that I want to send with my paper. In my paper, I said, yes, there are these Buddhist values that somehow are overlapping, uh, co-sharing, uh, the spirit with Confucian values. So you have the kind of Chinese Buddhist being Chinese, uh, Chinese Confucian and, and, and Chinese Buddhist at the same time. Um, but an example of the G are values that are shared by Buddhist and non-Buddhist. I met many members of the G that they profess to belong to other religious tradition, but still they can function in a Buddhist way. Uh, so that I think is, is very important. Uh, it's a very important teaching we're talking this lecture series about Buddhism um, contributed to society. And I think it's a very important teaching to contribute values in a global society uh, where you don't have just one faith and one group, but you have to think of global society as one family in a very Chinese way. So I believe that the kind of education that can emerge from that, um, um, from, from your talk is really, well, from the talk of Lin Jinlong, uh, it was really the kind of transmission of values that you find through the gym members. And that is something that is a really clear example of how education, education in a larger sense can have a value today. And, and pass it to what, um, Andre, to what you were saying. Um, education is a form of charity and there were many other forms of charity, of course. So it was not uh, just the delivery of Buddhist values or showing or being a model and an example. The same temples were organizing other kinds of charity doing so the example that I show, for instance, they have this um, helping with medicine and food to the poor. Uh, and this is something that you find in all the temples and you have um, for two different reasons. So one was the temple and, and doing that um, as an activity of a temple, as a Buddhist temple. And then you have also activities that were done by the temple as part of the programs of the Chinese Buddhist Association. We're talking about the Republican period, so the very first Chinese Buddhist Association. So um, they were doing for, they are done for different reasons and coming from two different perspectives. And indeed you have laity, not just monastics. Um, well, the prisons association were mostly laity. And you don't have just Buddhism, uh, you don't have just Buddhists. So sometimes you also have a cooperation of different groups, so with Buddhism, Christianity, uh, Taoism, Islam should not be forgot. There are um, scholars in China that have been doing work on uh, Shanji, so really on, on charity in the Republican period, focusing mostly on Chengdu area. So not so much around it. The Wu Hua is this lecture now at the Sichuan University. His book on Buddhism in the Republic and Chengdu has a huge chapter about um, charity. And, and, and recently there is a PhD student um, uh, Yan Ita, who is finishing now uh, work on this charity association or somehow, especially during the war and the kind of welfare in the war time. So it's kind of responded to, um, to what you were saying. So luckily, yes, we do have also lady and, and, and luckily we do have also people that are focusing precisely on, on these matters. Um, I see some hands, Vicky. Yeah, thank you very much for that. And um, we can move to the open discussion period um, now. And I do see a couple hands. I just want to remind um, those attending through Zoom can post their questions in the chat function here. And on YouTube or Facebook, you can just um, post your question in, in the comments and they'll be um, fed to us here. So, um, Professor Chen, did you have a question? Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Yes, this is really inspiring. As you probably know, I'm I mean, also recently uh, interested in Buddhist, uh, uh, Buddhism and, and education. So I find your talk particularly uh, revealing. And also I learned a lot from your uh, uh, very rich talk. Uh, just one question. So I, I'm uh, particularly interested by <laughs> Uh, your discussions on the role in the Buddhist place in prison, right? Uh, so um, uh, I wonder the, how this practice uh, was uh, related to the Buddhism, uh, Buddhist tradition itself. Uh, we know that, that uh, this is a uh, prison priest, right? Uh, quite normal in other religion, particularly uh, for, uh, for example, for, uh, like uh, Christ uh, Christians, or uh, Catholic 
please in the please in the uh, prisons, uh, but not so much. I think that uh, so often uh, we think of it that is quite well uh, in Buddhist tradition, particularly if we go back to uh, Ming and Qing, go back to uh, Tang and Song, uh, Tang and Song, right? Uh, period. We actually, I don't. Uh, I don't think that I can think of any similar uh, role in Buddhism uh, or Buddhist monk plays in, 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 in prison. So do you think that at least practice uh, during the Ming War periods uh, was uh, more inspired by uh, Christianity or Catholic or by Buddhist tradition itself? So this is my question. Uh, Vicky, should I reply questions as they write? Okay. Um, well, the role of Buddhism in prison, um, if uh, the, there is, and there are a number of associations in the West, so there is this kind of Buddhist counselors and Buddhist meditations in prison, so she's right. doing that. Um, when it comes to China, uh, when it comes to Taiwan, I believe, but not believe, I know they are, um, Melan China today. I have to be honest, I, 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 I cannot swear on that, uh, but I, certainly Taiwan is. And, and uh, for instance, Master Xi Yun, the founder of Shan, has been saying that he did that already in Ilan. And when he arrived in Taiwan, it's something that he has continued doing. Uh, so there is um, evidence that this was starting. For instance, if you look at Taiwan uh, right after uh, in the 50s or early 60s, it was a practice that was already done. When it comes to the pre-modern period, which is what you were saying. Um, Buddhists were not going to prison. Prisoners were going into. Right. Oh, there was there was a creation of this jin shi. That this was a Buddhist idea. A creation of this mm -hmm. jin shi where prisoners mm -hmm. were going. So you don't have uh, Buddhist monks technically going into a prison. You have either right. going. So that, that that is a little bit different. Um, the aim was the same. Uh, I think it was also kind of. Um, correcting works. So they, they were also called temple slaves, these inmates that were going into a temple to learn the Dharma and also to SPA to do a repentance. So that it was uh, it was something that you see in, 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 even in the now there are prisons that are people convicted and then they spend their time doing social social labor. So then, then so there is that and it, it, it was seen as something like this. And it, it, it was uh, some people Buddhists agree to do, and it was a call coming from outside the Buddhist world to do that. It was, and it's explained in the material that I found also as an evidence that um, Buddhist teachings appear as helpful for, um, because Buddhism was popular at that time. Um, so the masses were understanding Buddhism more than maybe Confucian teachers. So Buddhism was popular and then Buddhism could help uh, morally and, and, and to um, the prisoners. When it comes to um, Christianity, as you said, um, you do well the, the, in the Republican period, there are evidence of Christian groups that were not so happy about the popularity of Buddhism in prison. Mm -hmm. it's a very nice article that I will be happy to send to you, but it, it really talks about this rivalry that almost happened um, right. because yes, indeed, Christians were doing that. And, mm -hmm. and the reason when, when this practice became not so much inmates into mm -hmm. the temple, but uh, the Sangha into um, the prisons, that was really, I cannot even say the Chin, it's the Republican period, because the document is from 1910, so it really started in the Republican period. At the same time, it's explained that they were uh, Republican, in the Republican era, they were doing that, partly because it was part of this Chin code, but also because they were trying to reforming prisons, um, emulating what the other reforms that were done in Japan and in Western countries. It's also part of the kind of background where the West was giving new models and Chinese were trying to apply them uh, after some reshaping of filtering. So then indeed Christians were also there and Christians were uh, also in prisons and there was some rivalry in popularity. Um, during the, I found the evidence, especially from the Sui to the Tang, uh, I found less evidence from the Ming period, I have to say. Um, but I would be happy to, to look more and then share this with you. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. Um, Professor Hur. Yes, I would like to say something about um, uh, Dr. Lin Junong's situation for his absence today because he got an um, you know, urgent surgery uh, this morning. So uh, he's okay now. He's recovered very well. <laughs> so that's the reason he must be absent today. And he was so regret that he cannot be um, uh, join this uh, uh, talk and discussion. But thank you, um, Dr. Li Minnan can represent him to deliver his ideal. And one thing I want, had, want to commend about this um, uh, Buddhist education and also one question is about Dr. Lin Junlong uh, shared with me that it's important to lead him by example. Just, um, you know, Stephanie said, uh, leading by example is very important for the Buddhist education. And also uh, for the teaching of Siji, uh, you had to eradicate suffering and then provide the Dharma. That's the mission for doctors when they conduct, you know, a clinic on any patients. So this very important Buddhist education on the medical mission of Tsuji. And one question I want to raise to the Stephanie is about, uh, you know, Taiwan has been applied a Buddhist education in different field. So what else we can do in school and other school? What is your opinion on this in the nowadays in Taiwan? Thank you. Um suggestion of what to do in Taiwanese schools. Uh, huh. We have done uh, many things, uh, you know. I have, in, I have to say that, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, well, but I have to say that this is, I think, something that in many uh, schools, and I don't say just academic context, so college context, but also thinking of um, younger students, um, and I, it should be important to discuss more values, to have more debates. I think it's, 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 it's becoming less and less a place for debates. Um, I'm not talking just about university, but schools in general. Um, to leading by example and use this leading by example as a way to also teach some values. Um, and well, com, com, uh, there is a saying uh, in the Analects, try to remember, I think it's the book, 14 and he said that learning is for the someone should study just for the own self to um, to improve their own self and not just to kind of show off um, of their knowledge and and, and the way because Confucius was kind of it was a way to say that he was seeing this thing happening and so you have to go back to another kind of education so I think that's a kind of passage from the analects that could also be applied in education today. So try to have also a knowledge that is conducive to moral improvement. And it is... No. No, 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 no. Uh, no, you no, no, no. no, no. Uh, no, no. To speak, but you, the better, you know, you know to, to fulfill. Uh, action is more important than speaking. No, 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 it's another one. It's a book 14 that I remember. And it's, it's I don't remember by, by, uh, by heart how it's in Chinese, but it's Xue, so learning is yeah. way, uh, so it's for you. It's not way ran, but not way ran in the sense of, it's oh, yeah, yeah, not yeah. to yeah. show off. Yes, people. yes. So, and kind of going back to a form of moral yeah. cultivation, that doesn't mean yeah. religious. Yeah. Wow, well, that's, yes. that's the yeah, one. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. the one. You can memorize the analects better than I do. I, I just remember the, the message, but I think it's a very important message that should yeah. apply also in changing curriculum. Um, it's a time where I, I think what COVID uh, taught us uh, is the importance of being human. It's feeling completely powerless against the pandemic, feeling equal because the pandemic could take everyone, feeling powerless, and then I, I. I I thought then and I hope that it's going to be also a way to think of everyone like one humanity. There is something very important in Chinese culture. So not just from the book of changes, from the Yijing, but uh, also something that you find in, in Buddhism, the idea to be one universe. It's not a dualism. It is, we are all part of, of one family, of one world. And then when you have that as could be seen as a Confucian teachings, could be seen, could also be seen as a Christian teaching or in a Buddhist sense, then I think there is a kind of more uh, moral pattern 
uh, that can be, and it's, that can be taught and is very important, I think, in this time where social relationships are changing uh, with the social media and, 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 and that this kind of, uh, that has been an obstacle to the improvement of the way that people interact with each other. So I, I think it's because of, also because of that and the way that the 21st century is leading us, it would be very important to going back to that kind of values. And they don't have to be understood as religious values. They should not just be understood as uh, moral values. And I think it's the danger is that schools, they may see that as religious values and a kind of religious belonging or preaching or missionary, but it should not be seen in that way. It's kind of universal. You know, the third culture that Wana Yang was talking about, it was pretty much about this. Yeah, this is a wonderful direction. Yeah, thank you. And also very amazing that you mentioned uh, in the late 19th century, the master uh, Fang Chong, she also followed the principle uh, without work and there is without a meal and like a Bai Zhang master uh, is a principle is the same as a master Zheng Yan. So uh, it's very interesting also Tai Xu mentioned that the Sangha can be manufacturers. So I, I think it's just uh, good to know that it's really, uh, there's a tradition uh, or some example in the early uh, 20th century that the Buddhist nun has been fulfilled this kind of philosophy to have shared alliances, a shared support system. So yeah, this is wonderful to know. Thank you. Well, but, uh, I think when I was um, planning this lecture and writing it and the, the, the example of Master Jen Yen was coming up in my mind very often because Yes, indeed. She's also very much attached to one day without work is one day without work. Oh, somehow attached to, to the work per se. And also she has been studying um, Confucian texts um, when she was a young nun. So it was part of her um, learning was not just about Buddhist texts, was also about Confucian texts. In her aphorism, she refers very often also to non-Buddhist teachings, but this goes back to Confucian canons. So um, I really see uh, her as a kind of example that uh, what I've um, seen happening in Chinese history is still continuing. So yes, indeed. Thank you, thank you. May I share my personal experience? Yes, please. Okay, so, so because I, I have been uh, uh, some medical missions. And then I always remember uh, Master Teng and said that uh, uh, when, when you went, went to see uh, somebody, we witnessed the one who is in suffering and you were cherished that you are abreast because you witnessed that people in suffer. And then uh, if, uh, during the medical mission, I, I, uh, actually, if there are 100% goodness in the action, maybe only the people in suffer like ten percent of the goodness because uh, when they, they miss lost their uh, relatives, the the house was destroyed. But what we can give to them is only a small part of uh, their loss. But uh, the most benefit of is that from yourself because you witness the someone in suffer, then you you will know that you are, you are blessed. And then, and but uh, the most important part is that when the people in need got the help from around, around the world, like when we go medical missions, we have uh, doctors, nurses from the uh, United States, Singapore, Malaysia, all where we go together, like maybe 100 people, we take them to, uh, to help them. We, we are planting the seeds of them in their heart. So maybe uh, someday in the, in the future, when they become, uh, they become better or they have the, the, the capability to, to help others, that they will still remember when they are in suffering. There are a lot of group there to help them. That's a very important. This is a kind of a teaching education. And we, this is called, like uh, I, I can also uh, answer that we have now so called service learning. Then we go service, we all learn something. I personally, I think that when I go to the, when I went to the medical mission, I learned a lot. I really learned a lot from uh, uh, what we witnessed or uh, we did by example, our CEO as old as 78 years ago, he still go around the road and help others. 
And then as young as like I'm 50 something that I have to do more. This is I'm in personal uh, uh, education that you call myself. And then uh, print the seeds of love in the one who in suffer. And that maybe some karma, some, you know, maybe 10 years later, 20 years later, that I can uh, say some example in, in Turkey, we have our uh, commission there. We have a, a, a school for uh, refugees. And when they go to the university, they say that because they, they get help from Ciji and they will, when they become doctors, become, become a dentist, they are very willing to help others. I think this is also lead by example, but from the from when they are young. So I think that is also that is I think it is good for uh, as a Buddhist us teaching that we plant the seeds of the uh, into the heart of people in need. Thank you very and much. For that that was um, beautiful and inspiring. Um, we're actually at the end of time right now, so I think I'll just invite um, Professor Her first to say a few uh, closing words. Okay, and thank you uh, for uh, uh, Professor uh, Stephanie and also the discussion NGL and uh, Dr. Ling Mingnan and to join this all uh, together to share with the historical perspective of uh, Republican Buddhism and also provide the angle for the uh, development of modern Buddhism. I think we all share the ideal that leading by example is very important. Doing is much more important than wording and speaking. So I think now the Buddhism has developed is universalism, the ideal in terms of moral sense, uh, rather than the you know, purely religious sense. As uh, Stephanie mentioned that, uh, in, in Chinese Buddhism now also uh, adopt ideal of uh, Confucianism. Yes, it's true. It's also true in Siji from my own perspective. And I think it's a very valuable and very precious uh, angle for us to more understanding on the Republican Buddhism as well as the contemporary Chinese Buddhism. And I thank you UBC to organize this forum. And thank you, Professor Jun Hua Chen and Vicky, Ms. Vicky Baker to make this happen. I also appreciate uh, my team uh, of Tsuji who are doing the translation very well. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you very much, um, Professor He. Um, Professor Chen, did you want to say a few last words? Thank you. Uh, I Once again, I want to thank the professors. Um, um, yeah, uh, Stephanias, Mr. Or maybe a very fondly <laughs> called often in, in Taiwan uh, for this inspiring talk. I want to thank our donors on the Suji Foundations uh, for uh, sponsoring this lecture series. And I also want to thank the, uh, our colleagues at, at Suji Foundations and uh, who, the, I think, uh, has done a wonderful job <laughs> in uh, promoting uh, this talk. And uh, I want to thank my colleague, uh, Vicky Pickers and uh, Carol, uh, Carol Lee uh, for your hard work. <laughs> Get us so early to uh, take care of us. Uh, so uh, I also want to thank all of you uh, who joined us from different corners of the world uh, during this very busy season. <laughs> and uh, I look forward to your support in the future. So um, I think this is probably to be uh, announced by uh, Peking University, <laughs> but because uh, we have such a chance, so let me take the liberty. Uh, let me take the liberty uh, uh, of uh, announcing in advance uh, our fourth uh, yellow lex uh, in the lectures. This is will be the fourth lectures. Uh, from our uh, lectures as uh, Indian lecture series. Uh, the next one will be um, delivered uh, by Professor uh, Wei Daolu of the Chinese Academy of Social Science. And this is a uh, pregnant uh, on the uh, Huayan, uh, Huayan teaching. Uh, it's, uh, English title is All is One. Uh, Buddhism and and, and, rich, and enrichment and advancements of Chinese philosophy. 
uh, not only about uh, Huayan, but this is I believe that this uh, Huayan will be uh, uh, yeah have a very central <laughs> play a central role in uh, so uh, and the talk will be in January four uh, so we are going to announce this uh, uh, more formally uh, in due in due course so please do come back <laughs> and, uh, in about uh, one month yeah? so. Uh, thank you all, and uh, a good night, or <laughs> good day, uh, good morning uh, for a uh, friend in North America. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us, and it was a pleasure to see you all. Thanks very much to Dr. Trevagnan and to all the discussants and the panelists and all the wonderful staff at Suchi for all your help with the interpretation. So. Until next time. Bye for now. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank, you. thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Jinghua. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.